Thanks, Grayson and crew. Thanks, Savannah. Savannah's uh, kind of new. She's, I think it's maybe the second time, or am I missing that, Savannah? The first time. That's the first time. So, yes, yeah, we're glad to have her uh, singing with us. That's now Mrs. Dowd, in case I, I have to remind myself all the time. I ran up to her uh, during this week and say, hi, Savannah Carmack, and then immediately I realized I had misnamed her uh, and then corrected myself. Well, I want you to invite you to turn to James, the book of James, this little uh, epistle, this little letter. It follows the book of Hebrews. Um, it's a larger one. You're almost to the end of your Bibles by the time you come to the book of James. Um, and we're in our series, and we've titled this series, Hold Fast. Hold Fast is a term that kind of comes out of the nautical world of uh, what's often yelled on a ship when you get ready to go through the storm. Uh, they yell at the, the sail sailors to hold fast. It means find something that's going to be unmovable and uh, wrap yourself around it because the ship is going to go through some really difficult uh, times. And as we're reading in the book of James, we're reading uh, a pastor who's writing to a dispersed group of believers who are literally fleeing for their lives, all right? They're better described as refugees, as people who've lost their homes, lost their families, lost their livelihoods, and people who are on the run, uh, and the people that are, that are persecuting them are not unknown people. It's not strangers, if you will. It's people that... Uh, most likely a very early time when the church is primarily Jewish. The early church began and it was primarily Jewish. And these are early Christian Jews who are fleeing from persecution from other Jews who have rejected Jesus. The earliest martyr in our New Testament, the first Christian uh, following Jesus to die for their faith uh, is Stephen. And Stephen, you want to read about him in Acts chapter 7. Um, Luke's history of the early church. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is taken out into the public arena by the, his fellow synagogue attenders, by the people he very likely grew up with and knew, uh, and up and down the street. And they picked up heavy stones and stoned him for his commitment to this Messiah, Jesus. And so when we're reading James, one of the things we want to do is we're not talking, as we've joked before, uh, about uh, what in missions, in the mission world, they often talk about first world problems like, uh, you know, supply chain issues where we go and we only have 10, you know, uh, types of cereal to choose from instead of 30 uh, or those kinds of things. And because we don't have our type of cereal, we're, we're breaking down, right? Or our day is completely falling apart because our screen cover on our iPhone cracked today uh, and it's just going to mess up everything all day in terms of that. Or our internet happens to be running a little bit slow or something along those lines. Or we're going to get to the game today and we have some sort of problem with reception for the Super Bowl, right? I know nobody in here is interested in the Super Bowl, but... Uh, those kinds of things when they come up, the first world problems when if you go to the two-thirds world or the 1040 window as they call it, um, they're concerned about how do we stay alive today? How do we feed our children? How do we keep uh, evil people who are using us as pawns uh, to gain control over a country? How do we stay out of their way today? And so when we come to the book of James, we're dealing with that kind of dark setting. And so we've used this, it always helps to turn this thing on first, um, we've used this illustration to talk about the dynamics of what's going on in the book of James. And so believers here, as he writes, as you read all the way through the book of James, it's brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, as he writes to them. Sometimes it's dear brothers and sisters. And one of the things that you find with James is that he loves these people. And because th this is a difficult moment and the stakes are really high, he steps into this moment and he speaks with clarity, but he also speaks with bluntness to them. Uh, and he says to them that there are real resources that can sustain you and guide you through this moment, but you're going the wrong direction. And so what's happening here is you've got believers and these kinds of things are going on, right? It's not just the physical things that are happening. They're being abused by people that they know. Right? This is difficult. Jesus prepared his followers for that. 
right? You can read about it in Matthew 10. You can read about it in Luke 9 or Luke 14. You can read about it in those places. Jesus said that if you follow me, you're going to become like me and you're going to get treated like me. And Jesus was the most Jesus person ever. He said the right things in the right way, right? At the right time, he said them with the right uh, uh, tone of voice. And Jesus, because he came to bring them the truth that they were lost and broken and they needed to be saved, was rejected by them and was crucified by them. And Jesus said, if you become, if, as you follow me, you'll become like me and you'll be treated like me. And he prepared, particularly if you want to read Matthew 10, he said, they're going to take you into the synagogues. And these were Jews that he was speaking to. You mean our, our family and our friends are going to haul us up into the synagogues, into the places where we normally meet for worship and for fellowship, and they're going to beat you. They're going to turn you over to secular authorities. Uh, parents will turn against their kids, and kids will turn against their grandparents, and wife will turn against husband, and so forth and so on. Because when this new kingdom breaks into your family, it will challenge loyalties. And so they've got crushed dreams, right? They're, as I told you before, when we think about ancient people, sometimes we don't think about them in terms of this 2,000-year-old culture as if these parents love their kids the way you love yours, as if they didn't have dreams and hopes for their marriage and for their life the way we have, as if there weren't fathers who really wanted to provide for their families and to see their kids go and felt it was their job to protect their kids from the difficulties of life. And here all of a sudden, crushed dreams, they feel deserted by their closest family, they're abused, they're disillusioned, all these things are happening. And as these realities come crushing in, what James is saying is that God is getting squeezed out. So they're not turning to him to figure it out. And as human beings, we can't live under pressure like that without relief. We're going to go somewhere to find relief. And so what's happening to this group of people is they're despairing. There's a hopelessness that creeps in. What, what, what is there to do? Uh, there's anger. We're going to find that when we get to chapter 4, they're actually uh, fighting one another. And one of the sad things, if you've ever been in a time of crisis, often if you see a group of people in a time of crisis, it's usually one of two responses. They either turn to each other to get through the crisis or they turn on each other. Right? Because they're scrambling to get through. It's dog eat dog. You know, each, each person for themselves. Right? So kind of anger is there and despair. And then there's withdrawal on some, right? Uh, a person who's been abused, a person who's been disappointed with God, like, God, I, I, I've been serving you, I've been following you, and I've been faithful. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've got this sickness in our family. We had this tragedy that happened. Financially, we've had this difficulty. We've been rejected by people that we love. All these things have happened. God, I thought that we had this contract that if I did A, B, C, and D, that nothing bad would happen to me. Well, number one, there is no such contract, and God didn't sign it. And number two, he's told you that's exactly the opposite of what you can expect from following him. What he did promise is that the only way to know joy and faithfulness and effectiveness in his life is to follow Jesus, and then ultimately everything will be righted. All justice will be delivered and all vindication will be found, all right? So he said here, so withdraw, and then inevitably what's going to happen then is they're going to turn to false saviors, right? Something's got to deliver me. How am I get out from under this pressure? So uh, one, I can, right, one of the false saviors in our contemporary moment is suicide. Some people think that, you know, the way to, to deal with life is just to get out of it. And sadly, that is one of the major things that's happening in the moment, especially to young people. It's alarming how high it is. Well, that's, that's, I can't take it. I can't, there's no resources to deal with it. I don't know how to make any. The best thing I can do is just leave it. It's a false savior, right? Drugs, alcohol, pornography, social media, right? How many people are wasting so much of their life do you get your little uh, weekly accounting of how much time you spent on your phone today? Some of you probably turned that feature off, right? Uh, how much time you spent on it to think about where you were? I mean, distraction is one of the ways to deal with life, right? 
So for many people, you distract yourself. You go into things that are meaningless. And none of these, uh, most of these things, I should say, are many things, the distractions that we have. There's nothing wrong in and of themselves. It's when they become the way that we deal with life and the way we escape from life, right? Uh, one of the constant things is men who become passive and disengage, right? Uh, you need to go watch The Incredibles, one of the, the very theologically deep movies. Uh, the Incredibles there. Uh, and you've got Bob and the family sitting at the table, right? And the kids are in chaos, and he's completely disengaged, and, and his wife says, Bob, Bob, engage, engage. And there's a bunch of houses with people going, Bob, Bob, engage. Right? And so you're drifted away into your little world because you're escaping the difficulties of the day, and that won't deliver you because the chaos is still there. Right? The chaos is still there. And so false saviors are happening. So the fundamental thing that James is trying to convince them of, and this is the key verses, I would argue, for the whole book. This is the thing that he said that you're losing sight of this and it, you need to hold on to this truth. So don't be deceived, right? Don't be deceived by thinking there's some other way that you're going to get through hardship and face hardship, some other false savior that's out there. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, right? Every good gift and perfect gift comes from above, right? Every resource you need to get through this time of hardness is going to come down to you from the Father. And it's good gift coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. It just the, the, the notion I think James uses, not only does it speak to God being the creator of all things, but God himself is the creator of light out of darkness, right? So how are you going to find light in the midst of the darkness of the difficulties of life is you're going to turn to the Father of lights to let him shine some light in on it. Because every good gift comes down from him. So what wisdom do I need to try to understand what's going on? How should I orient myself into this struggle? What are some truths that I need to know? Well, one of the things I need to know is God is good and that God doesn't do evil and God doesn't prompt other people to do evil. So this evil that's coming at me is coming from below. It's coming from the evil one and those in league with him. So God's not up there trying to figure out as in the Greco-Roman world, you know, I'm just going to mess with those people today. Let me see here, you know, I'm going to punk you a little bit because I'm having a bad day and me and the gods are not doing well today, so I'm just going to go chop on you a little bit, right? That's not how God operates. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. And then verse 18, he says, matter of fact, you're his new creation. He's brought you alive and he's completing a work in you to bring you into this new life, right? The first fruits of all that he's created. So all, God is restoring what you've lost when you rebelled against him. And he's the only one that's going to sustain you to get through the darkest moments in your life. So we've said this before. We don't know as believers because as Chris prayed, God is great and he is big and he's infinite and we're finite. He's unlimited. We're very limited, right? But we, we know him we may not know why, but we do know the one who knows why, right? We don't know why, but we do know the one who knows why. And because we do know the one who knows why, that he's the God who condescended to die for us. He's the God who delivered us in the darkest moment of life, who took all the things that really threatened out of our life, who's demonstrated his love for us in the cross and demonstrated his power in the resurrection. We know the why. We know the one who knows why, but we don't know why. And because of that, I turn to him to get through it. So all the way through the book, and I give you this earlier, James is trying to help them follow the path of trials down to life. That's what he's trying to do over and over and over again. He's illustrating to them over and over again from scriptural truths how to confront difficulties and instead of responding the way you are responding, if you listen to God and his wisdom, you're going to go down another path and you've got a choice, right? And there's a parting of the ways. You can turn it into a temptation, whatever God allows into your life, whatever he allowed some of you, it was the parents you had. Some of you, it's the parents you do have, right? Or it's a difficulty at work, or it's a physical illness. Whatever has been allowed into your life, what God wants to say is that comes under his sovereign care. He's not up there asleep and somehow took his hand off the wheel and said, oh, oh no, good, look what happened, right? It's under his care. It can be any life circumstances that come into us, and the question is whether we'll go down that left column and we'll apply what we know of God. We'll dig in and say, God, I trust that you're good, that every good gift come down from you. And Lord, I'm going to turn to your word and I'm going to listen very carefully because I know it's going to have the wisdom to orient me rightly. 
And some of that wisdom is, God, you're good, so you don't do evil. God, things are not purposeless or pointless that you're in, in charge. God, I know that you've secured me completely so that whatever's happening to me right now won't threaten the things that really matter. So I need not despair or freak out. God, I'm, I'm even confident that in this you've told me that in this difficulty, you're even going to redeem it and take me deeper in my relationship with you and you're gonna more form me into the image of Christ. So I'm trusting you that this is not gonna be wasted. So all those things are truths that come. So we apply the knowledge of God. We let wisdom guide our direction and it takes us down to life, to flourishing. On the other hand, if we just say, well, I guess God is, 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 is not doing his job. I guess he's no help. I better look around for somebody else who can give me some advice and then our own evil desires that still exist within us will try to find some way to get out from under it that's illegitimate, that will only darken the issue. So as a young man struggles with lust, the world says, well, don't worry about it. You can just go ahead and satisfy that struggle. There's pornography, it's out there available. And all that does is just kill off love in your soul. It distorts your brain. It disables you from loving a real woman. It, it distorts your whole notion of sex and intimacy. It will kill you. You go down that path, right? So. James is stepping in and saying, okay, here's ways where you've responded that you've taken down the path to destruction. I'm going to come back and help you to see, number one, you're on the wrong path, and number two, how to help you get back on the right path. And so James is not only helping them get right on the right path, he's teaching them how they should, themselves should start thinking, right? So James itself is a model for us about how to face our own difficulties, right? How to face your loneliness, how to face your sickness, how to face your past that keeps coming up to bring regret or to bring it up in a way that justifies bad behavior in the present. James wants to teach us how to apply the wisdom of God so that we can know life. Now, I put this up here for you uh, because I'm encouraging you, if you haven't uh, gotten one of those little booklets that you'll find out under the sign out there to study in the book of James, it's never too late to start studying. Uh, and it's laid out in a way that you hopefully could have come here today and have read the, the passage a little bit. Mine's a little plussed up. I, I forgot that I had done this. That's a, this is actually my own translation of this passage, which is not uh, what usually happens. I would just recommend you use your NIV or ESV or whatever translation you use, but I just wanted to show you the way I study, uh, and if you find the... Uh, guidance that you find in the little book that I've given and we put together as elders, the very first thing you do is just observe and read carefully and think through it. And what I found uh, is I found that the, the passage begins by stating the issue, right? Right at the beginning. And because I did this on a, 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 in a Word file, I just went crazy with my little highlighter button, right? And highlighted everything because uh, I wanted to see things that are different. Uh, but I found that the whole passage really is addressing the issue that begins in the very first verse. And so it's trying to get after it. And then he illustrates the issue by something that's happening in their midst, okay? something they're actually doing. They're walking up to brothers and sisters who are perennially in need and deprived of the basics of life, and they're saying, be warmed and be filled as you starve, right? And James says, there's something really, really unchristian about that. Something really unchristian. And the way you're dealing with this tragedy is reflected in the way you're dealing with the most vulnerable people in your community. So he illustrates it with an application to something that's happening. Then he comes back and resolves the issue by saying, if, you don't, if faith doesn't work itself out and behavior consistent with it, it isn't faith at all. It's dead. And then he's going to support it from 18 to 25. He's going to support it with two arguments from Scripture. And he's going to use two examples, Abraham and Rahab. That's an interesting conjoining of two examples, right? Uh, immediately you would think of Rahab, right? In, in Jewish tradition and in tra and, and, um, um, Jewish teaching, Rahab and a Abraham were often conjoined together because Rahab is an exemplar, an example of somebody who extends hospitality to the stranger, which she did, right, with the, the, the spies who came in and she took care of them uh, and those kinds of things like that. 
And so, but she's here just a clear example of someone who acted on their faith. And she's really applicable to this group of people because the stakes for Rahab acting on her faith were really, really high. Because if she got discovered as a traitor, right, to Jericho, that's where she was, she'd be dead. So she believed God and acted on her faith consistent with her faith in a time that it, would, it did not really make sense on a human level. You're doing something pretty risky, Rahab. Well, here, James, the whole book is going to say the only way you're going to get through this time of difficulty is if you completely devote yourself to God, trust him, hold on to him without question. If you take some other path to get out, it's just going to take you down to death. So Abraham and Rahab, and then he's going to wind up. If you notice, he almost says the exact same thing in verse 17 and verse 26. The same is also true of faith, verse 17. If it does not have works accompanied it, it is dead by itself, verse 26. For just as the body is dead without the spirit, so also faith is dead without works, okay? Now, also... If you came up with a big idea or the basic teaching of the book of James that didn't, of this section that didn't say something about faith and works, you didn't read the passage, right? How many times works is in purple? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven times. I think James wants to say something about works, right? And then faith, right? One, two, three, four, and then if you count the other references to it, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I don't even know if I counted them all right. right? If you didn't say something about faith and works, somehow you fell asleep after you know, the very first phrase. What good is it? And then you right out, right? So the reason why the goal of all of our interpretation is to understand what God is saying in the Bible. And I say this to you as, as followers of Jesus, many of you who've known Christ over the years, one of the things that you have to fight against is coming to a passage that you've read before and not actually reading it because you think you already know it. And so you just need to pay attention to it afresh and anew because maybe you missed something important. Maybe you've been walking off with something that's a little bit of a skewed perspective. Maybe this time around, God has a different emphasis before he had something else. Now he wants you to get here, right? So this is what I do in terms of that. I just want to give you, so the outline that you have that's in your notes is just derived from my observations of what I saw in the passage, okay? So let's talk about it. Verse 14, but before we do, would you stand with me and let's read this passage. 2.14 down to 26. Read from the NIV here. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have deeds, works? Can such faith save them? Such, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Uh, the, the phrase he uses, uh, maybe a contemporary one, he's talking about an empty-headed person. Okay, You empty-headed person. Uh, so it's a, pretty, it's a pretty direct statement, right, to call this person here. Do you, know, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. That's a very important verse we'll come back to. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. May the Lord add his blessing reading his word. You may be seated. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is James gets underway, 
is he asks questions. And I don't know if you thought about this before, but James asks questions because questions, uh, unlike a statement, cause you to think about what's been said and make a response, right? To make a response. And he's asking questions, and he wants you to engage. And you'll notice here in verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? And so right at the beginning there, tell me what good it is, what's the profit of it, how can you explain that in a way that, it, that, it, that, it, that agrees with what God does when he saves a person. And then he asks a question that assumes a negative answer. Can such faith save them? Now the way it's worded is, that kind of faith can't save them, can it? Right? Is what he's asking. But that's the issue, right? Can you have a faith that doesn't express itself in a life consistent with what you have believed. Is there such a thing? And so James is going to contrast all the way through two supposed kinds of faith, and in reality, he's going to deny that the first one is faith at all, in the sense of a biblical faith, and that there's only one real kind of faith, a faith that is a trusting in God that turns into a transformed life as its outgrowth. That's the key issue, right? So he begins with rhetorical questions which amounts to a denial of any kind of faith without an observable outworking that can save you. And save here doesn't mean to rescue you from the difficulty. It seems to be save as it's often used in Scripture to refer to actually save your soul or more particularly that when you stand before God in the judgment that he will say you are mine. Because all salvation looks not only at what God does for you in the moment, but also the promise that when you stand before God at the judgment, he will claim you as his. Okay? So will that kind of faith stand you in good stead when you stand before God at the end of life? And the answer is no. And what we're going to see here is that James, and this is true of James altogether, James more than any other book in the New Testament echoes the teaching of Jesus. And what we're going to find here in James is something very, very close to what Jesus says in Matthew 25 as he encourages people to be prepared for his return. So we'll come back there in a moment. Now, so that's the first one. Can there be saving faith if there's no life consistent with its demands? Okay. Now, I'm going to say this here is James is going to speak not so much about how I assess whether or not somebody else is a believer. He's not really talking about by their fruits you will know them. Really, he's talking about a person assessing their own life. Right? What should you expect in a person's life who's really a believer? The thing that, that he's getting after is he's puncturing. You know, as I mentioned to you before, I think of the most disturbing person in all of Scripture is Judas. And the reason why he's so disturbing is he was able to live in a way that everybody who lived with him 24-7, right? And most of us don't live with people 24-7, right? People who are around him all the time. When Jesus said, there's somebody at this table who's going to betray me, nobody knew who it was. Jesus knew and, I'll, and also Judas knew, right? Judas knew. He knew that his heart was not worshiping and serving Christ as Messiah. He had other intentions, right? One of the darknesses about in the Christian world as well is you can have people who know how to play the game and can put a very good front up to other people. And the only two people who ultimately ever know if you're a follower of Jesus is you and Jesus, and sometimes we can play the game so well, we become self-deceived. And if you notice as you work your way through the book of James, he keeps saying, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, right? And God's mercy at times is to break through, right, this way of viewing ourselves or this religiosity and telling us, Greg, I'm after your heart. I'm after your heart. I'm not after someone who's a whitewashed tombstone, as he called the Pharisees. Right? I'm after your heart. And so it's here we're looking at this. And again, you're going to find with every believer, because we know this too, and James doesn't expect, you're not going to find perfection in any follower of Jesus because we're all on the way. Matter of fact, the whole premise of the book of James is that you're still vulnerable to sin's temptation. 
you need to constantly depend on God and, and draw near to him, or, or you can get hoodwinked, you can get deceived, right? So for all of us here, all of us are struggling with sin. All of us have, in, in this past week, moments where we repented and confessed of sin, right? And even Chris's prayer this morning took us into the reality that should have been a part of our everyday life. Right? I don't wait till Chris to pray on Sunday to deal with my sins. I shouldn't. Right? But Chris reminds us of the idea that we're all on the way people. So we're all there. But here there's a difference between someone who struggles with sin, someone who loves Jesus, and someone who's adopted a way of life that presents a facade that has no genuine relationship to God from the heart. Right? So this is an, a self-assessment tool and also God's mercy to make us aware of ways in which our profession of Christ, our genuine relationship with Christ is inconsistent with the way we're living. And all of us have those kinds of things as we look here. So here's the issue, right? Now the second in verses 15 and 16, saving faith would not be doing what some of you are doing. So it says here, uh, verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Now, James words it, suppose, and that this is actually happening, right? Just earlier in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, right? Let's just let's pull an example out, but he pulls an example out of something that really is happening in their congregation, right? Because earlier in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, uh, people who are coming in decked out, right, to the nines with their splendid raiment, right, because they're rich and powerful people, and their brothers and sisters who are not rich and powerful but are poor, they see the, the powerful influencer walk into their, into their thing and they go, whoa, 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 we got to give him or her, we got to give them the chief seats, we got to suck up to them, we got we to curry their favor, right? We need jobs, we need protection, right? That's how we're going to get out from underneath this stress. So they suck up this guy and, and just so happens, uh, Brother Marty sitting up there, Brother Marty just saw his face, Brother Marty's sitting up there and, and Marty's poor and he doesn't have anything, he goes, Marty, Marty, get up, get up, get out of that seat, Marty, let him sit down and Marty, you go over there and sit by my feet. And James digs in and says, you guys don't believe the truth about the kingdom. Marty is a kingdom citizen. He's more wealthy than the most wealthy individual who doesn't know Jesus. You have kicked out the rich person and elevated the truly spiritually poor person. And you've encouraged the spiritually poor person to trust in their riches or to damn their soul. And you've discouraged the poor person who truly is rich from believing that they are rich. Right? So it's happening. And so he draws on the, the issue that's happening here. And he says, suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Well, not any good anymore. And he's going to say here, their words of comfort are no more good than a faith that doesn't live itself out, right? So uh, as I've joked with you before, if uh, when I, my, I was a younger dad and I had my girls in my home and I would walk around Xenia and if I walked around and my girls were coming behind me and they were malnourished, right? They're, I didn't feed them. They had just, uh, you know, clothes that were barely hanging on them around the thing and you meet me. Pastor Will meets me there, and he's looking at me a little bit askance as he sees me and, and my ragtag family there. Um, and he's a little concerned. And he says, Greg, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing well. He said, well, I'm, I'm looking at your daughters, and I'm a little concerned. And I, I respond to Will and say, well, don't worry. I read Bible stories to them every day. Okay, Greg, that's really great, but do you feed them? Do you feed them, Greg? Have you bought any clothes for them lately? No, no, no. I'm just concerned. I really, really do love them. Trust me, I really love them because I read them stories. And I tell them every night while they're shivering in their beds, be warmed and be filled. And Will looks at me and says, Greg, you don't love your daughters. What are you talking about? I say be warmed and be filled every day. I say it multiple times a day. Greg, that's not what love looks like. That's hate. And James is getting at this very difficult thing where we often use Christian terminology to cover unchristian behavior. 
Okay? We'll talk about that a little bit here. So this is the real thing that's happening. So here's the illustration, and this sets up uh, a discussion that James is going to say the real thing behind this is that this is inconsistent with your trust in God. This is inconsistent with your belief in Him. If you really believed in God truly in this area, you would be treating these people differently. And then he's going to go support it from Scripture to say that's just not the way faith behaves. So don't come to tell me that you have faith and you behave this way. Right? This is one of the things that happens often, right, in the world in which we live, in America and different places. We can get used to using biblical terminology. And matter of fact, one of the characteristics of a charlatan is someone who can use biblical terminology really well and hoodwink a bunch of sincere people because they're just looking to say, did he put a little Jesus on that? He did put a little Jesus on that. He must be a good guy. And not ask, well, is that Jesus really Jesus? Is that what Jesus teaches? Is that true to Jesus? Does his life match up with that? Because if you put a little phraseology on it, right? Okay, well, that sounds good. Sounds Christian to me. Right? And so the issue here is he's going to get at the idea, well, let's look at the life. Let's look at the life, right? So verse 17, he comes back and he makes the straightforward statement. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead, right? Now, there's a bunch of things we want to say here. Faith here precedes the works, okay? We're going to talk about the relationship between them. But faith here is tested, and he's talking about not the root of salvation, but the fruit of salvation. We'll come back and talk about that in particular. So a genuine belief in Christ is going to work its way out into certain behaviors, right? This is the teaching of Jesus, right? You remember the parable of the soils? So if you want to look that up, you go to Matthew 13, the parable of the soils. Well, the sower goes out, right, and sows this message of the kingdom, right? Jesus is the king. He's come back to defeat all that stands against us. He's going to go up to the cross and provide a way for us into the kingdom. He's eventually going to come back and establish the kingdom. So they're throwing that message out there. And then they're watching the response as the seed falls in different hearts. And so it falls in some hearts. And there's no doubt that they're genuine believers because the fruit comes out like a hundredfold. Their life is consistent with their belief in Christ. So they, they, they say, you know, I found the pearl of great price, and so I turned my, my life against everything else, and this is the most important thing in my life, right? I, I, I take up my cross, I identify with him openly, and I follow him. His values and passions become mine. His mission is mine, right? And so you don't have any doubt about that. On the clear other end of the spectrum, you know, that seed falls out there, and it, it hits a piece of stone, and it's just tink, 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 tinking around there. Right? And nobody has to ask, I wonder if they believe the gospel. They've rejected it straight out right. The ambiguous ones are in the middle. Right? The ambiguous ones are in the middle where the seed goes out, and as soon as pressure comes in, sounds like the book of James, they bail on Jesus. Or they get attracted by the things of the world, and it springs up a little bit, and then quickly fades. Right? And so Jesus prepares his servants that as you sow the seed, you're going to find very interesting things. So don't be surprised that you're going to find some people who profess Jesus, and as soon as it costs them something, they bail on him. Don't be surprised by that. Right? And this is exactly what's happening here. The, the test is coming, and, and one of the benefits of God's tests is not to just remind us that he's at work taking us deeply into a relationship with him because his tests are always to purify us, to draw us deeper, to mature us, to take us more deeply into the life. Sometimes trials function as mirrors to show us to ourselves. And when the pressure comes in, how you go to relieve it is very instructive about what you really trust in. Follow me? Where do you run when the house is on fire? When the relationship is in difficulty? When you get the bad result from the doctor at the hospital? Where do you run? What do you do? And God's mercy, even to us as believers, is to point out the idea that we have idolatry in our hearts. Right? You've had a relationship with a young man or a young woman, and you thought it was really going well, and then it, it stops. 
And all of a sudden in that crisis, you recognize that that person had become an idol in such a way that your life has stopped. That Jesus is not sufficient for you now because he's not there, she's not there. And now you're in a fetal position internally over somewhere and you're excusing your, 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 your uh, withdrawal from life on the fact that God's not been unfair to you or you can't go on. And God in his mercy is saying, you're not ready for the kind of relationship that you need to have because you need to put me in the place that you can sustain the inevitable moments in a relationship when the person will, will need to be loved and you will have to love them when they don't deserve it. So your life rises and falls on the external factors instead of on your relationship with Jesus. So he's getting after this and he's going to say it here. If you don't have a faith that lives itself out, then it's dead. And trials will expose you to yourself. It will expose you to yourself. You'll get to see who you are because trials break down the facade. This is what he's going to say in chapter 3 when we get there too. You can work really hard at trying to keep your tongue under control. But boy, when you get under pressure, right, that's when whatever's in there is going to come out because you can't keep it suppressed. And it becomes, whoa, did that just come out of me? Right? Did I just look like, you know, like a crow that was just cawing and and clawing at people? Is that me? I I think I, I became the Incredible Hulk right there in that moment, right? So those are the kind of things that he's after. All right, so the support. Here's what he wants to say. The counterposition, saving faith can be a workless faith or a faith that works. This is where he starts off in verse 18. Somebody says, well, there's actually two kinds of faith. You can have a faith that doesn't live itself out. That's still good faith. And you can have a faith that lives itself out, right? And James responds to that and says, no, 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 no. That's not true. There's only one kind of faith. So there's two kinds of faith that this person thinks exist. Like, you know, Ryan has a faith with deeds and I just have a deedless faith. And they're both good, right? And James is going, no, 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 they're not the same thing. Matter of fact, this faith is no faith at all. It's the same kind of faith that demons have, right? So this is what he moves, the very first thing. He makes an argument, right, in verse 19, right? Faith that doesn't uh, uh, manifest itself in drawing near to God and trusting in him and obeying him, right? What was Jesus' measure of love in John? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? So this whole idea that you can, oh, I believe in Jesus, I just don't do anything he tells me to do. Or I believe in Jesus, but you know, in this area of relationships, I just don't, I just don't accept his constraints on my sexual appetites. You know, I believe that Jesus is, is Lord, but... You know, this whole thing about, you know, giving my money to these other groups, no, I don't think so. I I believe that Jesus is Lord, but, you know, I just kind of keep him in a pocket so that when I go to high school, I can still hang out with the same group. Because he costs me too much if I'm too Jesus. Or Jesus, he's great, and he guarantees he's going to take all the bad things out of my life, but when he doesn't keep up his end, then I get to choose to do my own thing because he hasn't kept up his end. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which we do that. But this is, right, the demons know that Jesus exists. You want to read about this, read in Mark chapter 1 when Jesus comes and confronts this person that's demon-possessed. And the, and the demon speaks out of the guy, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God, right? The demon knows who he is. But the demon doesn't fall down to worship him, doesn't serve him, doesn't draw close to him. To know that is not trust in, right? There's a lot of people who know that. I know about Jesus, but that's different than I've trusted in Jesus, right? Key idea. Well, then he moves on. Then he goes to use Abraham in verses 20 to 24, okay? So key verse here, we're going to come to the verse, uh, read with me here. And he says, uh, as he goes on in verse 20, he sets it up, that you foolish person, right? This is a, a kind of a, a way of dealing with an issue that James uses and Paul uses this too, if you've read through the book of Romans, where he'll bring out uh, a supposed uh, objection that somebody would raise, right, to his position, and then he'll answer it. And so he says here, uh, 
you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless, right? So that faith without deeds is really no faith at all. Do you want evidence of that? Well, so here he comes and gives us two examples, Abraham and Rahab. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Right? Now there's a whole bunch of things here that I won't take you in. I'd be glad to have conversations with people about trying to figure out. This was uh, Martin Luther, right, the famous reformer. Uh, and his emphasis on the book of Romans, uh, James just kind of irritated him. And he just called it a straw e epistle, meaning something that, that uh, was not worth considering because he really struggled to get around James chapter 2 with the way he articulated salvation. And one of the key things that's here, uh, that as we work at this, is James and Paul are really after two different things. And we're going to talk about this. James is after the fruit of salvation. Paul's after its root, right? And I say that deliberately to give you something to remember, right? So he's not talking about that upon which you are saved. He's talking about what it will look like if you have genuine saving faith. It'll be completed. It'll be vindicated by these kinds of activities, right? And he creates what Paul believes too, right? Paul always says that faith always works itself out in love. You can read about this in Galatians, right? Or in the book of Romans, that famous book, Paul says, I'm going around proclaiming the gospel to bring Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. So the, this, uh, the idea is that the root is abandoning yourself and trusting in God to do for you what you cannot do. And then the question that James is dealing with, if you have done that, well, then what happens to that person? What's the fruit of that kind of life? What does it show up as? And so he's going to say here that the na saving nature of Abraham's faith was vindicated. It will be, it's vindicated then, and it will be vindicated at the final judgment, and it's reached its goal in what he did. So the faith that you have in Christ was not, right? This Sometimes we, we, we try to do this and say it facetiously. Faith in Jesus Christ is not fire insurance that then lets you go about living your life as if you don't know Jesus. It's an encounter with Christ that transforms you, that makes you new, that gives you a new set of appetites, a new set of desires, a new purpose and direction. And as you read the scriptures, as you come around God's people, as you grow, it continues to transform you until you look like Jesus when you see him. So it's a dynamic that sets off something in your life that it's going to change you. As a matter of fact, God loves you so much that he's going to go after you. And the book of James is saying he will allow difficulties in your life to uproot idolatries, to deal with things so that you'll turn to him and be freed from them and grow. Because you need some spiritual fortitude. So the whole premise here is it's going to reach its goal. So James is going to say Abraham makes it clear, right, that he acted on his faith. He acted consistent with his faith that vindicates his faith and shows that the faith that he had went to the end that's consistent for genuine believing faith. Now Rahab, right, verse 25. In verse 25, it says, uh, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Now here, uh, he's simply going to use what seems to be a shocking example here. But here it's Rahab who demonstrates because her faith was vindicated since she acted on it, right? I notice faith always proceeds and faith produces this kind of fruit. And Rahab here demonstrates genuine faith as someone who exercised hospitality toward people that if they was found out she had given them hospitality, she would have been killed. She believed in God and believed in what she had heard and seen among the nations and said, no, 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 God is on your side. I believe in him. And so therefore, I'm going to protect his people. So Rahab becomes an example of someone giving hospitality 
uh, in faith to others, right? Now, here's where I want you to look at Matthew 25 with me for a moment. Matthew 25. Why don't you come down to verse 31. This is a teaching section in the book of Matthew where Matthew is um, recording the teaching of Jesus where he assures his disciples of his future ultimate triumph. The son of man, this one that that Daniel prophesied, this son of man who has access to the very ancient of days, who's going to be given a kingdom that's going to be opened and ruled over in the end times. Jesus claims that identity for himself. And he speaks about that time when he's going to return and establish his kingdom. And as he speaks about that return, he urges them to be ready for his return. So we live in the biblical storyline in between the first and second comings of the king. The king came the first time, declared his identity, proved his identity through the things that he did and taught, explained what it meant for him to be the king, and then he went up on the cross and made a way for people to come into his kingdom because flesh and blood can't get into his kingdom. Non-transformed sinners can't get in there. And then he came out of the grave to demonstrate his authority over sin and death. And now, those who believe in him are going proclaiming the king came and the king is coming. Are you ready for the king? And so here, Jesus talks about you need to be ready for the king because when he returns, there's going to be judgment and vindication. Judgment for those who reject him vindication for those who embraced him and so here in Matthew 25 he's talking about what kind of life will meet with God's approval at the judgment what kind of life and so in chapter 25 here's what he says look in verse 31 and we're familiar passage of the sheep and the goats when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him And he will separate the people from one another. As shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, this is when I often say this at school. For those of us who grew up in church, right, the Jesus who lets the children bounce around on his knees and plays with lambs needs to grow up to become the judge of the living and the dead. And this is the judge that is so comprehensive in his authority that it makes it clear that he's going to resurrect everyone to stand before him in the end. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Well, that naturally says, well, when did that happen, Jesus? Verse 32, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So their belief in Jesus was manifest by the way they cared for the people of Jesus. And so Jesus looks for authentic faith to have been lived out by the heart of Jesus for the most vulnerable people within the family. So here he continues, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Apart from me, you who are cursed in the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and the angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. 
They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger and needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not truly help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. So here James picks up Jesus and says, if I know Jesus, if I know Jesus, if I've bowed the knee to Christ, if I've submitted to him, if I've believed in him, he is transforming me. He is. And there's usually two things. One, sometimes I may be unaware, but in his grace he's going to make me aware. Other things, God has transformed me so that I just love to do what I've been created to do. Other ones, he's pointing out to me things that are inconsistent with my identity and asking me to change. But there's no such thing as a faith in Christ that does not openly identify with Jesus. There's no such thing as a faith in Christ that does not obey Jesus. There's no such thing as a faith in Christ that does not have his heart for his people. So the call for us, right, in times of trouble, you know what's, what's the most intuitive thing? Right? Even when you think of hypothermia, if a person is dying of hypothermia, they talk about how you try to huddle to save the most the significant organs and you let the other ones die on the outside to try to do it. In the Christian world, when we're under stress and difficulty, James says there's enough resources to care about people who are worse off than you. You hear me on that one? I mean, your natural thing is each, you know, each person for themselves, right? Get in, the, get in the boat, let's get after it. And Jesus is saying, one of the characteristics of, is you trust in God that you're ultimately secure so you don't need to worry about scrabbling for food and raiment. You need to be concerned if you have the heart of Jesus about am I faithful to God in the midst of this difficulty? So in this moment, this is the, this is the chaplain on the deck who's trying to help people when the Titanic is sinking deal with their relationship with God while the ship's gone down. He's not screaming and running around He's got an unnatural calm in the midst of crisis because he's secure. But the other people need Jesus. And in the midst of these moments, one of the things that God wants to do to us is that we become people who even out of our need, even out of our struggles, we're, we're leaning in on the goodness of God, leaning in on him, and we're loving one another. And one of the things that sets our church apart any church apart if we're followers of Jesus is we take care of one another holistically. Follow me. This is what it looks like. God in his mercy wants to take us out of saying the right words because he wants us to become his people. Right? Pray with me, will you? And then we'll close. Can you stand with me? And we'll pray. Lord, this is, uh, uh, Lord, this uh, just hits me, Lord, in so many different ways. Um, we're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Well, we're saved by faith alone because we know we can't save ourselves. This is not about doing things to merit your favor. This is not about doing things to keep you loving us. It's nothing along those lines. We don't do what we do out of insecurity. We do what we do because we have been loved. And Lord, you, you want us, Lord, to get inside the truth that, that you're a good God, that good things come from you, and that everything that we need for the difficulties of life, Lord, you're the resource. Lord, we need your wisdom for our marriages. We need your wisdom for our parenting need your wisdom for our friendships. We need your wisdom for our dating lives. Uh, we need your wisdom to deal with our physical illnesses. We need your wisdom to deal with the, 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 the fragments and broken places from our life in the past. Lord, we need you, and Lord, we need uh, your wisdom. But Lord, we recognize that when you save us, Lord, you empower us, you transform us, and you send us. Help us, Lord, 
uh, by your mercy, Lord, to be your people. Forgive us in ways, Lord, we've neglected other people uh, out of a selfish concern to make it on our own or because we've devalued their need uh, or we've thought we don't have a responsibility for it. So Lord, thank you for these men and women. Bless them, encourage them. Uh, Lord, we need you in every way. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a good day.